To judge from the arrowheads strewn beneath the city walls, the final struggle was fierce. But the end, when it came, was swift. The great palace burned. The temple of Zeus was desecrated. Corpses were heaped in the theater. And when the invaders moved on, and all but a few of the inhabitants were dead or gone, the only sound on the long, straight streets of the city we call Ai Hanum was the sound of wind from the steppes. Ai Hanum, located in what is now northern Afghanistan, was one of the many Greek settlements scattered across Central Asia by Alexander the Great and his successors. For two centuries, first as outposts and then as centers of a rich kingdom, these cities thrived and grew in settings profoundly different from those of the distant Mediterranean. And then, cut off from the rest of the classical world by invasion and war, they slowly faded from view. This video will explore their fates. Alexander the Great entered Central Asia in the summer of 330 BC, having already won a series of spectacular battles and conquered half of the Persian Empire. The King of Kings was dead, and soon, it seemed, the last remaining Persian governors would surrender. In the event, it wasn't quite so easy. First, a powerful noble declared himself the new King of Kings, and he had to be dealt with in a campaign that stretched into the following year. Then, raids from the steppe forced Alexander to turn and attack Confederation of Nomads. Then, having put the nomads to flight, he plunged into two years of savage guerrilla warfare with the lords of the Persian East. Only his marriage to Roxanne, daughter of the greatest local potentate, brought an end to the struggle and allowed Alexander to continue east into India. The heart of the newly conquered territory was the region of Bactria, centered in what are now northern Afghanistan and southern Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. The plains of Bactria, watered by the river Oxus and its tributaries, were irrigated and fertile and dotted with prosperous towns. Seeing the territory's value and aware of the need to secure the northeastern flank of his sprawling empire, Alexander settled no fewer than 10,000 mercenaries in Bactria and founded a series of cities. Almost all, characteristically, were named Alexandria. After the civil wars that followed Alexander's death, Bactria was incorporated into the kingdom of Seleucus, a former commander of Alexander's bodyguards. Seleucus and his successors reigned over the eastern part of Alexander's empire, a huge block of territory extending from the Aegean to the Hindu Kush. Although Bactria lay at the eastern edge of their domains, they took pains to defend it and encouraged thousands of settlers, both retired soldiers and adventurers from old Greece, to immigrate into the region. The governors of Bactria became increasingly independent, and from the mid-3rd century BC onward, they ruled as kings. The kings of Bactria were aggressive and successful generals, pushing the boundaries of their kingdom north into the steppes and south to India. And despite the isolation of their realm, the Bactrian kings continued, like Alexander and the Seleucids before them, to recruit Greek settlers and found cities. The wealth of the Bactrian kings was proverbial and wonderfully displayed in the kingdom's beautiful gold and silver coins, which circulated throughout Central Asia. There were, it was said, a thousand cities in the Bactrian kingdom, all of them rich. Many of these cities had a long pre-Hellenistic history and had only been reorganized and renamed by Greek kings. But some really were new foundations, and one of these, one, in fact, of the most important cities in all Bactria, has been excavated. That city is Ai Hanum, mentioned at the beginning of this video. We don't know what the actual Greek name was. Ai Hanum is Uzbek for Lady Moon, a reference to a local legend. Whatever it was called, the city was an impressive place, expanded and embellished several times over its century and a half of existence. The city stood at the confluence of two rivers. The streets behind its tall mud brick walls bounded blocks of low houses, many equipped with Greek style bathing rooms. The main avenue, nearly a mile long, connected the gates with the main public buildings, a huge gymnasium, a theater with seats for 5,000 spectators and a palace with a majestic reception hall. Ai Hanum was an emphatically Greek city. The excavators uncovered a public fountain with dolphin-head spouts, 
a mausoleum in the shape of a miniature Greek temple, a monumental shrine inscribed with the maxims of the Delphic Oracle, and even the imprint, pressed by chance onto mud brick, of a Greek philosophical treatise written by a follower of Aristotle. The gymnasium, itself a quintessentially Greek institution, was supplied with olive oil imported from the Mediterranean. There were pebble mosaics in the palace, and the Temple of Zeus featured a colossal seated cult statue modeled on the famous wonder of the world at Olympia. But if Ahinoum was a Greek city, it was also a Bactrian city. Almost all the buildings, even the theater, were built of mud brick in keeping with local custom. The grand reception hall of the palace was inspired by Near Eastern models. And, despite its Greek occupant, the Temple of Zeus looked like a Persian shrine. At Ai Hanum, in fact, ethnic Greeks were almost certainly a minority. We should imagine a relatively small group, descended from Greek settlers and their local wives, coexisting with a larger native population that had, to various degrees and for varying reasons, become familiar with the Greek language and Greek culture. Ai Hanum, in short, reflected the potentially precarious nature of the Greek presence in the East, and it would share, like all the other Greek cities in Central Asia, in the collapse of the Bactrian kingdom. The Bactrian kings were almost constantly at war. To the west, they faced two rival empires. First the Seleucids, their nominal overlords, and then, as the Seleucids faded, the rising menace of Parthia. To the south, they hurled their cavalry against the elephants of the native princes and Greek warlords of India. But the greatest menace lay in the grasslands of the north, where the nomads roamed. Alexander had known it, and had founded the fortress city of Alexandria Escate, Alexandria the farthest, to meet the threat. The Greek kings of Bactria knew it too, but they were powerless to stop it when it came. In the middle of the 2nd century BC, the Shangnu, a nomad confederation that ranged along the northern frontier of Han China, decisively defeated the Yu Shi, a rival confederation. The Yu Shi migrated westward, driving other tribes before them. These tribes, led by the Saka, descended irresistibly into Bactria. The king met them in battle and was crushed. As the broken remnants of the royal army fled south into India, the nomads surrounded the kingdom's rich Greek cities. A few cities, including, apparently, Ai Hanum, resisted and were destroyed. But most seemed to have come to terms with the invaders. A Chinese traveler who passed through Bactria a decade after the invasion found many rich cities, each governed by a petty chieftain. Not long after, the Saka were defeated by the Yushi, the same tribe that had driven them into Bactria in the first place. The Yushi settled in the region, and, sometime in the early first century, one of their chieftains declared himself king, established his authority over the whole confederation, and founded the Kashan Empire, a sprawling state that came to include both Bactria and much of northern India. It was under the Kashan Empire that the Greek cities of Central Asia had their final flowering. The Greeks had always been a relatively small minority, and many had fled or been killed during the destruction of the Bactrian kingdom. But many more remained. Their history is unrecorded. The art of the Kashan Empire, however, bears witness to continued Greek influence. A dramatic example is the Kashan Palace at Kalchayan in what is now Uzbekistan. The palace courtyard was decorated with a rich array of Greek-style sculptures, and the walls featured paintings of Hercules, Athena, and Nike, among other Greek and Iranian gods, watching over the Kashan rulers. The Kalchayan frescoes and statues are predecessors of the fascinating Buddhist art of Gandhara, a southern province of the Kashan Empire. The Kashans patronized Buddhism, as did many of the kingdom's merchants, who had grown wealthy on the burgeoning trade of the Silk Road. It was through the Kashan domains that Buddhism first entered China, and it was under the influence of the empire's Greco-Bactrian artists that Buddhist iconography evolved many of its conventions. The Buddhist stupas and monasteries that sprouted across the Kashan Empire often featured figural sculpture inspired by Greek models. A famous example is the Bimaran Casket, shown here, a golden reliquary discovered inside a stupa near Jalalabad, Afghanistan. 
Here, the Buddha, the central figure, appears in a pose and setting taken directly from Greek sculpture. The figures wear Greek hemations and stand like Hellenistic statues in a classical architectural frame. Perhaps the most spectacular witnesses to the continuing artistic influence of the Bactrian Greeks are the Tilia Tepe tombs. These first century burials, discovered in 1978 in northern Afghanistan, belonged to a nomad chieftain and his five wives. More than 20,000 objects were recovered, including a staggering amount of gold jewelry. Much of the jewelry, like these dolphin riding cupids, was Greco Bactrian work. Another impressive sign of the continued Greek presence and influence in Bactria are the coins of the Kashan Empire. For more than a century, Kashan coinage was basically Hellenistic. The legends were in good grammatical Greek, and Greek gods often appeared on the reverses. Greek, in fact, seems to have been the administrative language of much of the Kashan Empire for more than a century, and stray inscriptions suggest the existence of substantial Greek-speaking populations as late as the 3rd century. Gradually, however, Greek influence declined. In the mid-2nd century, the great Kashan emperor Kanishka formally declared that his court would cease to use the Greek language. His own coins reflect the change, with Greek legends being replaced by those in Bactrian, an Iranian language written in a Greek-derived alphabet. After the collapse of the Kashan Empire in the 3rd century, all trace of the Bactrian Greeks is lost. Although there's no hard evidence, the ultimate fate of the Greeks of Central Asia is easy to surmise. They had always been a small minority, and after the destruction of the Greek kingdoms of Bactria and India, they had lost all political power. Elements of the Greek population may have enjoyed Kashan patronage, but without any special status or privileges, or any particular reason to maintain ties with a homeland none of them had ever seen, the Greeks of Central Asia simply faded into the cultural background. Some of the cities founded or refounded by the Greeks still exist. Alexandria and Arachosia, for example, is now Kandahar, Afghanistan. Kandahar, in fact, is a corruption of Iskanderia, or Alexandria. Herat, Afghanistan, likewise, was originally Alexandria Ariana. A few of the Greek cities in Central Asia have been at least surveyed by archaeologists. At Merv, Turkmenistan, the ancient Antioch in Margiana, the rectangular walls of the Greek city can still be seen in the midst of a vast sea of mud-brick ruins. Near Balkh, Afghanistan, the walls of ancient Bactra, capital of Greek Bactria, still rise in a dramatic ring over a plain cratered with looters' pits. Although Bagram, Afghanistan, is best known for its airfield and base, it's also the site of the ancient Alexandria of the Caucasus, and it was here, about 90 years ago, that archaeologists discovered a fabulous hoard of Kashan luxury goods, which included carved ivory from India and enameled glass from the Roman Empire. Many of the Greek cities in Central Asia, however, are just names on a map, associated, more or less tentatively, with grass-covered hills or remote ruins. And even the sites that are known are being progressively destroyed, year after year, by looting. Bactra has been torn to pieces over the past 20 years. And Ai Hanum, once the best preserved of all the cities in the Greek East, has been devastated by treasure hunters with tractors and bulldozers. Cities pillaged in this way are lost in truth, and lost forever. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Told in Stone on Patreon. Every donation helps me to continue making carefully researched videos on ancient history. You'll find a link to my Patreon page in the description, along with the inevitable plug for my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.